Hi, in this video we'll be talking about polar coordinates. And this section in particular doesn't actually have any calculus in it. We will get to calculus applications in the next section. But I think for many of you, you have not been exposed to polar coordinates in your previous classes, even though it doesn't require calculus. So we'll do an introduction to the idea, and then we'll, in the next section, talk about how we can apply calculus ideas. So the idea motivating all of this is that in math and in the world we live in, there are a lot of things that are round. Right? They are circular, they're cylindrical, they're ovals, they're ellipses, but they're shaped in ways where the x-axis and the y-axis meeting at a 90 degree angle, right? This idea of like 90 degree angles and perpendicular and even parallel lines doesn't really mesh with what those things look like and how we think about them. Um, and also there are certain curves that are very hard for us to describe talking about x and y. So there are a lot of contexts where we want to understand something and the way x and y coordinates work doesn't really help us. So that's where we use what are called polar coordinates. So let's look at an example, right? Just plot the point 7, 2. And we're going to be talking about another kind of coordinate. So often to avoid confusion, we will talk about these as the rectangular coordinates. X and Y coordinates and the X and Y axis really relates to a lot of pictures where we wind up drawing things like rectangles. So the rectangular coordinates of this point are 7, 2. Right? So it might look something like so. I'm not drawing all my tick marks, but there is the point, right? We go seven units in one direction and two units in the other direction. Old news. You've known about this since pre-algebra. Now, this is a perfectly reasonable way of describing the location of that point compared to the origin, but it might not be the most natural way in certain circumstances, right? Imagine we just want to move from the origin here to the point P. It might feel a little artificial to actually say, oh, we're gonna go perfectly horizontally, then turn at a 90 degree angle and go perfectly vertically. We're allowed to do that, but it doesn't feel very natural. Instead, we might wanna feel like, you know, let's just think about where that is directly. If we go directly from the origin to this point, we could talk about its location in a different way we could somehow specify the direction of motion and specify the distance, and that would also get us there. So instead of having two points that are representing distances, we might have one direction and one distance, and that would describe how we get there. What direction do we point in and how far do we go? So this is what polar coordinates do for us. They specify distance and direction. So the distance, we usually call that r. You can think of that as an abbreviation for radius because we could draw a relevant circle where that's the radius. And then the direction, we're gonna use a number here. And so we're gonna measure an angle. We'll do this the way we would do in trig where we draw an angle in standard position and we think about the terminal side heading towards p. So see if you can figure out how to add to the diagram you've already drawn in a way that emphasizes what could we look at to measure this thing r and what could we look at to measure this thing theta and then try to compute the values. Right, so hit pause and actually try to do this. So we could imagine drawing a picture like so. What if we just go straight from the origin to that point p? This distance is r, and this angle in standard position, remember we start at the positive x-axis and move in a counterclockwise fashion, that angle is theta. And we could compute these. Right? By the Pythagorean theorem, we could draw a right triangle here. This distance is 7, this distance is 2. So r squared equals 7 squared plus 2 squared. So r squared is 53, and r is the square root of 53. Let's approximate that. 
7.280, three decimal places. And then this angle theta, we could do SOHCAHTOA, tangent of theta is opposite over adjacent, which is 2 sevenths. So for theta, we could do inverse tangent. And we'll do that on the calculator. Inverse tangent of 2 over 7 is approximately 0 0.278 radians. We might not have good intuition for that. Uh, one radian is about 57 degrees. So this is roughly one quarter of that, right? So it's in the teens in terms of degrees. Certainly degrees are more intuitive, but calculus is done in radians and we're warming ourselves up for applying calculus to these ideas. So now try to draw something a little more general. Right, just a point. Don't really specify specific coordinates, just it has an x, it has a y. And how are r and theta and x and y all related? Maybe you can write down formulas that tell us how we can figure out some of these from something else. So again, hit pause and do your best here. So I'm going to draw a picture a little bit like the one I drew before. I'm going to put it in the first quadrant because that's easier, but we might want to think about how the things can change. Maybe here's my point P. So from the point of view of rectangular coordinates, this is X and this is Y. From the point of view of polar coordinates, this is R and this is theta. So there are a couple of things we could write down here, right? We could do a lot of SOHCAHTOA. Cosine of theta is X over R. Sine of theta is y over r. Tangent of theta is y over x. And then by the Pythagorean theorem, x squared plus y squared equals r squared. For these, we'll notice we could rearrange these and we would have r cosine theta is equal to x. r sine theta is equal to y. So what we might notice from these two is if I tell you what is r and what is theta, you can compute x and y. Right? Theoretically, you don't even have to draw the diagram. You could just know, oh, x is r times cosine theta, y is r times sine theta. And then we'll notice that these have x and y together on one side of the equation and either theta or r on the other one. So if we know x and y, we could figure out tangent of theta and presumably work backwards to figure out theta. We do want to remember that inverse tangent has a range only in the first and fourth quadrants. So we have to be a little bit careful. This version is definitely true. To say that theta is inverse tangent only works some of the time. And then here we could take square roots of each side. So it's certainly not wrong to say that r is the square root of x squared plus y squared, although I'll mention a little modification of that in a second. So that's what we have on this next page. We have conversion formulas. If we know the polar coordinates r and theta and want to know what are the rectangular coordinates going from polar to rectangular, they're the two that I saw before. And if we already have rectangular and want to do polar, here are the formulas. And I have a couple of notes. For this one here, it's in terms of r rather than r squared. Certainly you could do this. But theoretically, right, it would also, it would not be wrong mathematically to say, actually, oops, let's write it like this, that r is the opposite of that square root, right? We might not feel that that works correctly geometrically, but here's the interpretation, and we will need this sometimes. If r is negative, we can think of that as specifying the direction, but we have to move backwards, right? So just as a little picture here, if I tell you that, say, theta is pi over 4 and r is negative 1, what that would mean in terms of polar coordinates 
is we specify that pi over 4 direction, 45 degrees. And this would say move backwards one unit in that direction. So that's the way we make sense of a negative value of r. It's not meaningless. It specifies moving backwards, just like a negative x-coordinate or a negative y-coordinate has a meaning. Uh, as I mentioned before, what is always true, assuming x is not 0, is that tan tangent of theta is y over x. Um, right? There's a modification here. If we, we have pi over 2 or something like that, you can figure it out without a formula. But generally speaking, x is not going to be equal to 0. Tangent of theta is y over x. This is what you would want to do intuitively. Be very careful. Inverse tangent will always give you an answer in the first quadrant or the fourth quadrant that may or may not be what you want. If you have something, right, just as an example, right, suppose we have a point over here and we do inverse tangent of y over x. Sorry, my little bit of moisture on my iPad and it's not writing correctly. If you do this, inverse tangent of y over x, you will actually get the angle pointing in the complete opposite direction. That's not the direction you want, but you can fix that very easily by going across. And so you could add pi to that to get the correct direction. You're always allowed to add 2 pi, right? If you just want to make something more exotic, you can spin around as much as you want. But sometimes we have to add or subtract pi. Um, and let's just point out polar coordinates are not unique, right? This one right here, I could specify that this point has r equals negative 1 and theta equals pi over 4. But I could also say theta equals 5 pi over 4 and r equals 1, right? That's going to point in the correct direction. Or I could say theta equals 13 pi over 4 and r equals 1. These are different angles, but they are coterminal. They, they specify the same direction. So just be aware, polar coordinates are not unique. All right, so practice this a little bit. In each case, I'm giving you either x and y or r and theta. Draw a little picture to make sense of this, and then do your best either by using the picture and intuition or by mechanically following those formulas, figure out the other coordinates. Um, and four out of six of these can be done without your calculator. So do that, right? Give yourself an opportunity to practice things like Pythagorean theorem and basic trig because it's assumed that you do not need a calculator for all of this. All right, so I hope you've had some success. Here, our point has rectangular coordinates of negative 2 and 2. So it's here. Um, so this distance, right, basically we have a triangle like so. R would be 2 root 2, right? That's an isosceles right triangle. So 45, 45, 90 rules. You can do Pythagorean theorem, but if you just know you're multiplying by root 2, that's faster. And then this angle here. It's basically the 45 degree angle in the second quadrant. That's 3 pi over 4. And remember, those choices are not unique, but those are probably the most intuitive answers. For this one, x equals 1, y equals negative root 3, which is approximately negative 1.7. So our point is here. You might notice that we have a 30, 60, 90 triangle. This distance is 1. This at distance is root 3. So this is 2. And then this angle would be negative 60 degrees or in radians, negative pi over 3. Okay, here, x equals negative 12. y equals negative 5. Here is our point, 
you might recognize this Pythagorean triple, 5 squared positive or negative plus 12 squared positive or negative is 13 squared. So r is equal to 13. That distance is 13. And then we want to find that angle. Well, we could do inverse tangent of y over x. And if I do that on my calculator, I get that that's approximately 0 0.395 radians. Okay, that's a pretty small radian measure. We're, we're pointing in the wrong direction. So we need to fix that. Theta will be this plus pi. And that's approximately 3.536. So those were three examples where, oh, wow, well, I have A, B, B. This is C. Those were three examples where we started with X and Y, and we calculated R and theta. Let's do it the other way. So here, R is 5 and theta is pi. Let's think about the direction first. A direction of pi is like so. So we are pointing straight left. And then we are going five units in that straight left direction. Well, that's the point that we would usually think of as x equals negative 5 and y equals 0. We don't really need the formulas here. We're just drawing the picture and making sense of it. Okay, here r equals negative 4. So remember, that means we're going to go backwards. And theta equals negative pi over 6. So the negative pi over 6 direction is like negative 30 degrees. It's like so. Now we're actually going to point in this opposite direction because we want to go backwards for units. Now we still have 30, 60, 90 triangle lurking in this picture. Right? Once you see anything with pi over 3, pi over 6, we know we can rely upon 30, 60, 90. So we don't have to slavishly follow those formulas if we can use our intuition. This will be a distance of two. This will be a distance of two root three. So our x coordinate is negative two root three. Our y coordinate is two. Certainly it would not be wrong to say x equals negative four times the cosine of negative pi over 6, and y equals negative 4 times the sine of negative pi over 6. Right? That's the way if you're just straightforwardly following the formulas. No harm in that. But sometimes it's nice to just have a picture and to use kind of this deep knowledge about 30, 60, 90 triangles without feeling like everything is a memorized trig formula. And this last one, 5 comma 2. So let's be careful here. This is theta. So theta equals two radians. Two radians is something like this direction. Okay, it's bigger than pi over two, but substantially smaller than pi. And we're going five units in that direction. Here we need a calculator. X is five times cosine of two. We'll approximate that on the calculator. approximately negative 2.081, and y is 5 times sine of 2 radians. That's approximately 4.546. And that seems plausible from this picture. If this total distance is 5, then that y coordinate is very close to 5, and that x coordinate is negative and substantially smaller. Now, polar coordinates help us think about individual points, but that does not going to help us do calculus. Right? Calculus, we want to think about functions and curves and all of that stuff. So we can apply this to talk about curves. And we're going to talk about curves in ways where maybe x and y are not as helpful as r and theta. 
So let's look at a very specific example. R equals cosine theta. We can think of this as a function. I have R all by itself in terms of theta. I can plug in theta, calculate the cosine, that's R. That sort of means if you tell me the direction, I know the distance. Whatever direction we're pointing, this formula will tell us the distance we go in that direction. So what I'd like you to do is make a little table. We can think of theta as our input variable here. And we can think of r as our output, cosine theta. So make a table of angles you, whose cosine you know and what is the corresponding angle. So pause and do that. So let's do the full first quadrant of the easy ones. So if theta is 0, then r is cosine of 0, which is 1. If theta is pi over 6, then r is cosine of pi over 6, which is root 3 over 2. If theta is pi over 4, then r is cosine of pi over 4, which is root 2 over 2. If it's pi over 3, it's 1 half. If it's pi over 2, it's 0. And now let's at least do the other quadrantal angles, pi, 3 pi over 2. Here we would have r equals negative 1. Here we would have r equals 0. And then I could pick stuff in between. Maybe 3 pi over 4, cosine there is negative root 2 over 2. Maybe uh, 7 pi over 6, cosine there is negative root 3 over 2. Uh, maybe 7 pi over 4, cosine there would be root 2 over 2. All right, perhaps you have a slightly different set of values. Now, try to plot these. And please remember that these numbers that you get from doing trig are actual numbers with values. If you don't know roughly how big root 3 over 2 or root 2 over 2 is, you can't really make sense of this. So just broadly speaking, I will remind you that to one decimal place, root 3 over 2 is approximately 0 0.9 and root 2 over 2 is approximately 0 0.7. So let's try to draw what this looks like. We're just going to do our best. Don't co just convert anything to x and y. Just think about distance and direction. But let's mark out where 1 is in each direction. So here, this first one. If the angle is 0, then the distance is 1. So if I'm traveling in this forward direction to the right, I go 1 unit. So we have a point right here. If the distance is pi over 6, so if I'm traveling in this direction, I go a slightly shorter distance. I'm just going to do my... So some people actually draw in all of these different directions. You can actually find graph paper that has all of the nice angles specified. So I'm going to go a slightly shorter direction here, maybe something like so. Now in the pi over 4 direction, I go even shorter, about 0.7. I'm just doing my best. In the pi over 3 direction, I go half a unit. So I know roughly how long 1 is, something like so. Over here, in the pi over 2 direction, if I'm traveling straight up, how far do I go straight up? Well, zero units. So if you're going straight up, don't even... Now, let's look at this one. The 3 pi over 4 direction. The 3 pi over 4 direction is like so. How far do I go in that direction? Well, I actually go backwards, about 0.7 units. Right, so something like so. In the pi direction, I go backwards a full unit, which actually gives me this point again. I'm writing times 2 there. So some of these points repeat. Uh, what else do we have? 
If we go in the 7 pi over 6 direction, something like so, we go negative root 3 over 2. Well, that gives us this one again, right? That one also repeats. In the 3 pi over 2 direction straight down, that's another 0, so this one repeats. And in the 7 pi over 4 direction, right, the point that we already plotted there repeats. So we might suspect that all of these would repeat if we pick the right things. So now you want to play connect the dots. This is not going to be a function where y is a function of x. But do your best, and maybe can you imagine if we filled in all of these different ones, right? Every single value of theta and find the corresponding r. Can you get a sense of maybe what this graph looks like? Maybe you can, maybe you can't. Right? We, will, we don't have to have this memorized, but perhaps you have an inkling as to what this looks like. Right? And I'm not going to address that immediately. In this particular case, there's another way we could do it. If r equals cosine theta, then I could multiply each side by r to get r squared equals r cosine theta. Then by my conversion formulas, r squared I know is the same as x squared plus y squared. And r cosine theta I know is the same as x. So now I'm describing that same graph in terms of x and y. Maybe you know what that looks like. So I will just walk you through this. You could write it like this. And then you could complete the square over here to write it like that, adding 1 fourth to each side. And what we have is x minus 1 half squared plus y squared equals 1 half squared. I think many of you have seen this. It's not essential that you have, but this is a circle where the center of that circle is at x equals 1 half and y equals 0. And the radius of that circle is 1 half. Let's try to imagine what that looks like. Here's 1, here's 1, here's negative 1, here's negative 1. The center of the circle is there at 1 half comma 0. And we go half a unit in every direction. So I'll plot just the topmost, leftmost, bottommost, and rightmost. And then it's a circle like so. Oh, no. Sorry, let's get notability to turn this into a circle for me. There we go. Right, so that's the actual thing. It literally is a circle. Right, from what we did here, that's probably believable. Right? Maybe not something you would know for sure, but now that you've seen that other one, it is believable, like, oh yeah, all those points are on the same circle. This is not supposed to be obvious in all cases, and what we were able to do here with the conversion, we can't always do. But here's the good news. Your calculator is equipped to graph things in polar coordinates. When you're doing a graph, if you go to the menu and for graph, by default it usually is just graph function. But if you have your calculator handy, actually open up the document. And if you go to graph, right, in your graph menu, number three is graph, then you have some choices. Five under that is polar. So it'll ask you basically for, if you're trying to graph this on your calculator, it would prompt you with basically r1 of theta, right? What is the formula for r as a function of theta? It numbers it one in case you're graphing more than one at a time. So you could type in cosine theta. And if you want to type a theta, the button that gives you pi also has theta handy. It will also ask you what range of theta you want to look at and what is the step size. Because all the calculator is going to do is connect the dots. So let's do a full spin from 0 to 2 pi. Right? That's usually a good idea. Sometimes we might want to do more. And then for the step size, pick something pretty small. 
right? I'm going to do 0 0.05. So basically, it'll plot a point at 0 0.05 radians. It'll plot a point at 0 0.1 radians at 0 0.15 radians. That'll probably be pretty accurate. When you graph functions, it just does this automatically. When you graph in polar, it's a little bit picky, right? And it drew the circle for us. Now, just to practice, graph these others on your calculator. I'm not expecting you to know what these ought to look like, but one at a time, graph them on your calculator. So for 3 minus 3 sine theta, the graph looks something like so. It's like crude drawing. The name of this graph is called a cardioid. And if you know cardioid, and if you know what the root cardi means, or cardio, hopefully that picture makes sense. We could graph four times five theta. I'm not, not, not four times five theta, four times sine of five theta. What that is going to look like might remind you of a flower. It'll have five part symmetry where the radius gets bigger and smaller and bigger and smaller and bigger and smaller and bigger and smaller and bigger and smaller. And my picture here is atrocious. The correct one has five part radial symmetry. And this last one doesn't actually use trig. It just says R is theta over five. And if you graph that one, you get a spiral. Because basically what it's saying is as the angle gets bigger, the distance gets bigger. And if you stopped it at two pi, it'll just stop there. But theoretically, if you changed the bounds here, it would just keep spiraling and spiraling and spiraling and spiraling. Now, you're not expected to know what these are supposed to look like. If we did a couple of weeks with polar coordinates, I might expect you to know some of the patterns so that you could look at a formula like this and already know, oh, it's gonna be one of those flower things that'll have five petals and each one is four units long. There are definitely patterns here. All you really want to understand is many very nice graphs are easy to explain in terms of R and theta, even if they're hard to explain in terms of X and Y and the calculator can do the heavy lifting for us. Um, and just a couple of notes here. We're just dealing with pictures in two dimensions, or x and y. Once you wrap your head around polar coordinates, you can extend it into three dimensions. Cylindrical coordinates are when we have polar coordinates and then we add z to measure height. Basically, we can imagine going straight up above the x-axis. And spherical coordinates are when we add a new angle called phi. Some people pronounce it phi, some people pronounce it phi, which would give us the angle of elevation above the xy axis. It's kind of like latitude, right? Spherical coordinates, it's sort of like what's the longitude, what's the latitude, and how far are we from the origin? We're not going to go into these. If you take a full class in multivariable calculus, you definitely will learn more, but you might want to think about how could it be helpful to think about things in three dimensions from a point of view that emphasizes distance and angles rather than rectangular motion.
and hopefully that makes sense to you. All right, this has been a pretty long video. Let's bring it to an end.